Welcome to the Sword and Trial podcast. The Sword and Trial is a podcast of Founders Ministries. And Founders exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of local churches. I'm Tom Askell. I'm Graham Gundon. We're delighted to have you join us again today as we look forward to introducing you to our special guest. But before we do that, uh, Graham, we got some things coming up and some uh, information we want to pass around to folks. Can you go over that yeah, with us? Yeah, so uh, the Institute of Public Theology is prepping for some more classes this coming summer. We just did class Classes with Conrad and Bayway, Mark Coppinger, mm-hmm. Vody Bauckham. Yeah. Yeah. Great classes. Um, but this summer, June 20th, uh, we are doing survey, New Testament survey with Travis Allen. And then directly following that, on June 27th, we are doing Church History 1 with Tom Nettles. Yeah, Tom Nettles will be down here, and um, both of those classes are going to be well worth your while. We will make a special arrangement for pastors if you would like to fly in and take this course. We've had that happen now over the last several that we've offered, and uh, we will make that as accessible to you as possible. In fact, uh, because we are about to complete our first year of the Institute's courses, we are making a special offer now. Now for registration, we're going to waive the registration fee for the spring. So if you'd like to look into the Institute of Public Theology and want to register to consider being approved as a student and being able to take the courses as they are offered uh, fully um, made available here and then also accessible online, uh, you can register for free. Just go to the Institute of Public Theology.org and there's more information there about that. We'd love to talk to you more about this and we'd certainly love to have you come on board as a student. We have the 2023 Founders Conference that is also uh, beginning to build out. We're looking forward to having Bodie Balkum, Joel Beakey here with us. Paul Washer will be here as well as we look at the doctrine of man, biblical anthropology. So I encourage you to look at your schedule in January 2023 and come down to sunny southwest Florida in the middle of winter and enjoy this wonderful conference. Yeah, and what a time for that topic as well. Oh, my goodness, yeah. The church needs it. You know, we need it, I think, individually just to be able to deal with uh, what we're facing uh, culturally and some of the political things that we're dealing with as well. Yeah. I mean, even asking the question will offend some people. You know, <laughs> what do you mean, man? Why not woman, right? Well, let's uh, introduce our guest. We've got William Wolf with us today, and William is coming from Louisville, Kentucky, where you are a student at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Is that right? That's correct. I'm uh, here on campus. Uh, Coming to you live from the Springdale Apartments, if anyone's familiar with Southern, you might know where those are and what they're like, um, which is, it's fantastic. They've been a wonderful landing uh, spot for me and my family. I'm married to my wife, Lauren, two kids, full-time student here, uh, and I also do some part-time work with organizations like American Reformer and the Freedom Center out of Liberty University. Wonderful. So, yeah, tell us a little bit about your background. I mean, I just have gotten to know you basically online, though we did meet in person briefly last year. Uh, But I've just followed you on Twitter, which, by the way, I think you have a wonderful uh, way about communicating things in 280 characters that isn't often uh, done very easily. So uh, kudos for that. But tell us about your background. I mean, how did you get to where you are? What have you been doing with your life? Yeah, thanks. Well, I, I appreciate that. My my Twitter usage, I just got on the last five months, I, I hope has maybe been the, the culmination and some, some fruit of the last 10 years uh, that by God's grace, I've been able to experience. And that has primarily been working in the political field. So the last decade of my life, I was in our nation's capital, um, entrenched in the swamp, and I was working in politics. I actually moved there to go to a church after becoming a Christian. Um, at the end of 2011, we went to Capitol Hill Baptist Church, oh, okay. Capitol Hill Baptist, and um, and then I needed work. So by God's grace, I'd always had an interest in politics. I had been thinking maybe I'd go to law school at some point in my life, but um, I, I passed on that and ended up working for a few members of Congress uh, on Capitol Hill and then for Heritage Action, which is a grassroots advocacy organization connected with the Heritage Foundation. And then I worked at the State Department and the Department of Defense from uh, 2017 to the beginning of 2021. So what did you do at the DOD? I was our (laughs) Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, for Legislative Affairs. So I coordinated with Congress. Um, Each executive branch agency has a congressional committee that exercises oversight over its budget and policy. Um, For DOD, it's got a couple, actually, but one of the main ones is the House Armed Services Committee. And I was our lead liaison with them. 
as we work through things like the National Defense Authorization Act, which is a massive annual piece of legislation that um, sets forth military spending priorities and policy authorizations, et cetera. So when Congress was mad at the DOD, I was the first person to find out. <laughs> they were mad at you. What a job. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, what an interesting Yeah, it was thing. a blast. Yeah. So, uh, I'm, so you, are, you became a Christian, moved to D.C., you're thrown into public life, I guess, probably not immediately, but at least pretty quickly. Sounds like after you got to D.C. and spent the better part of 10 years uh, working in different aspects of government. Is that a fair assessment? That's correct. Yep. Yeah. So as a Christian working in the uh, government in our nation's capital, uh, you must have had lots of questions, lots of challenges, lots of opportunities to try to put together uh, your faith in politics, your theology in public. So uh, give us some ideas about how you sorted all that. And um, maybe, uh, I don't know if you made any missteps that you want to recount or, or some aha moments that God helped you to see things more clearly. Well, I would love to give uh, a shout out and some credit to my dad, Michael Wolf, in terms of potential missteps. When I was a college kid uh, in, in 2008, this was this is a pivotal conversation. I'll never forget it. Um, the economy has essentially tanked via the housing market recession, and you know I'm looking at getting out uh, into the job market. And I'm feeling pretty disaffected, uh, frustrated at sort of the policies of the Bush administration. And here comes this charismatic figure, Barack Obama, you know, and uh, I remember talking to my dad about him and saying like, you know, something along the lines of, hey, this guy, he really sounds good. And my dad's like, look, William, I don't care what he sounds like and I don't care what his other policies are. He is pro choice. He is pro abortion. You can't vote for that um, if you hold to a Christian worldview. And that that really I, that, I've never forgot that conversation. That really huh. stuck with me. So um, that was helpful. My dad just really putting that that number one political priority, I would say, for Christians front and center in my life 14, 14 years ago. Mm-hmm. And since, be, you know, becoming a Christian and, and moving to Washington, D.C., that's that's been a guiding issue that I've really tried to focus on and, and, and work on. Um, and I think should be one of the central goals of all Christians in the public space is to try to bring an end to abortion in the United States. Well, that's fascinating. So obviously your dad had not been reading much from the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission (laughs) that uh, carves out space for Christians to vote for uh, politicians who advocate abortion. Yeah, my dad probably hadn't even ever heard of them at that point. (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, I just recently the ERLC put up an interview with Daniel K. Williams. Uh, Ethan Lamb did it. And that's his point is that, you know, Democrats or Christians who are more uh, voting for Democrats, they have their position. And and those who vote more Republican, they have their position. And he treats abortion as just kind of a a personal ethical uh, concern, personal ethical concern which I think is just fundamentally flawed. It's you know, Murder is a personal ethical concern, and so you might be against it. I might not be as opposed to it as you are, but, hey, it's personal ethics. It's not public ethics. And uh, you've just said, your dad made a case, that no Christian could vote for a politician who advocates the murder of unborn babies. Now, you realize that that's a, that's a pretty contentious view in our circles today. Yeah, I think that has unfortunately become increasingly contentious over the last, um, I don't know, let's say five to eight years as other dominating political narratives have been competing for the heart and soul and the affections of Christians in the public square. Uh, I think that we've we've allowed ourselves to be taken in by this rise of sort of a, a both and or an either or. So maybe Democrats are good on justice and economic policies you know, even if they're bad on abortion. So we can sort of take that and this. Um, And quite frankly, I would argue that that's not accurate. One of the things I love to encourage Christians to do is just read the party platforms. Mm -hmm. Go read it for you. Go read it for yourself. Because the reality is the Democrat platform is fundamentally anti-creation and anti-God through and through. I, I watched the State of the Union recently and I left it thinking we've got to give up this this false narrative that democrats are good on other issues they're just bad on abortion Mm. they're bad across the board and look i I, i'm not necessarily a card-carrying member of the republican party by any means you don't 
you don't have to be a part of your local county GOP by any means. Um, but Christians should absolutely fight for God's created order and moral reality and goodness and human flourishing in our public square. And right now there's one party that's committed to essentially undermining all of that in every way imaginable. Mm. Yeah. I went back and read uh, the democratic platform before the 2020 election, just to get my, my thoughts uh, clear again on all those issues. And I came to the exact same conclusion, you know, abortions in there like six times, I think specifically named, but then the implications beyond that one issue are disastrous for uh, any nation. And uh, I just don't see how a thinking person could vote Democrat like you. I'm not saying that means you got to vote Republican, but I don't know how you could do it and uh, vote Democrat and mm-hmm. think that you're following um, a well-informed conscience. Yeah. Hey, um, I agree. William, so you've been very involved in, in politics and uh, in the public square and it seems that uh, one voice that uh, keeps coming out um, and is fairly loud and pretty frequently comes out is, you know, a Christian who is too involved in politics is really kind of just elevating the status of their nation to the status of the kingdom of God and um, is trusting in princes and not really trusting in God. And so maybe a Christian should vote and be faithful to vote, but other than that, shouldn't be real real vocal about politics because it's you, you kind of lose a little bit of your faithfulness. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe you could speak to that as a Christian who's been working in those spheres for quite some time. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad that for the most part uh, throughout history, many Christians have not shared that view and they've worked aggressively to do things like end the slave trade, like William mm-hmm. Wilberforce, you know, folks like Abraham Kuyper, um, even people like Bobby who understood, the reformers who understood that as Christians, we don't leave our faith in any way, shape, or form behind the doors of our house. That when we walk out into the public square, we bring it with us. And we don't bring it with us ultimately as just some other competing claim to a version of reality. We carry it as God's revealed truth. We know that men are men, women are women. God made marriage to be between a man and a woman. Human life is valuable because we're made in the image of God. Um, and so I, I would say that Christians don't have the option to be apolitical or unpolitical, um, particularly in this day and age. So in terms of how we keep those in priority in our lives, I think one of the key things is, is being a member of a local church. That is something that should, if you're, I will say, if you're a member of your local GOP, but you're not a member of your local church, you're in sin. It doesn't yeah. matter if you don't vote for a Democrat. You need, if you're a professing Christian, uh, Christ comes to the church and you need to get embodied with the local believers. Um, but I, I do also think it's a matter of stewardship. God has entrusted us as Americans in uh, this political environment with a wealth of stewardship that we should work to see um, you know, his good and our flourishing furthered. So does that mean you're a Christian nationalist? Sure. Why not? <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, I don't know if that's what Graham I knew was it. getting at exactly. But that was exactly my question. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, I don't know. You know, I'm sure you guys have been tracking this, but um, essentially my take on that is if Donald Trump hadn't won in 2016, nobody would be talking about Christian nationals. Mm. I I don't think, I don't think those books would have been written taking America back for God by Samuel Perry and Andrew Whitehead, um, the power worshipers by Catherine Stewart, even Jesus and John Wayne by, uh, you know, Kristen Kobes Dume. Those books could not have been written in the context of Trump not having won in 2016. So my my take on this is essentially swap Christian nationalism for Republican, and you get a better sense of what they're actually driving at there. Yeah. Isn't it fascinating that uh, guys like David French and, and some others have just, it seems like they've almost lost their minds over what they believe to be happening to the evangelical world and I've tried to understand it. I'm not sure that I got my mind around it yet, but it seems to me like they've just bought into the narrative that has been spun by these folks you've just mentioned in the books that they've written, that yes, if you advocate for uh, the traditional family, if you advocate for male leadership in the home and the church, then you are nothing but this uh, uh, strong arm patriarchalist who is trying to repress women and everybody who doesn't look like you. And therefore we've got to renounce that because we're Christians. And it's just, it's like they've forgotten. We've got a book. Mm. You know, we've got a book that talks about these things and we're not obligated to just kind of 
twist them around and, and pretend like they're not there. It's fascinating. Have you had any interaction with uh, David French or guys that seem to be buying into the narrative from people that I don't think they would fully agree with theologically? Sure. Well, I think that um, I think that orange man bad is a terrible heuristic for interpreting the world. You know, <laughs> essentially the Trump derangement syndrome has taken a uh, deep root in many people's um, intellectual and I'd say even um, their spiritual views of, of reality. Look, when I became, uh, when I became a Christian, moved to Washington, D.C., uh, I, I, in my early years, I read a lot of National Review. I l- read a lot of Jonah Goldberg. I read a lot of David French. I would say that guys like them helped me sort of build out um, my sort of principles for engagement. And then along came Donald Trump. And all of a sudden I found myself on, you know, completely different side of this question. Should Christians support or vote for Donald Trump than they were? And that confused me. And I, quite frankly, these guys, they are well-paid, you know, political pundits who essentially whiffed the biggest political question of our day and age. Is Donald Trump going to win the presidency? And I think they've been searching for an answer for how they got it wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would argue that a little bit of humility and introspection um, would lead them to the conclusion that, well, look, maybe 80% of evangelicals really genuinely voted for someone they hope would bring it into abortion, not we're all closeted, you know, white supremacist Christian nationalists. Um, And so I think that they're, they were shaken in their understanding of the American political context and priorities, and they've been looking for an answer ever since, and it's continued to take them down a road, I would argue, that's further and further away from the ground truth reality in our country. Mm. So you've worked in government uh, as a Christian, and now you are uh, pursuing a more formal or finishing up more formal theological education uh, as one who has that in your background, still very much involved in uh, thinking about governmental issues and public policy issues. Uh, Talk to us a little bit about your view of the role of government and how Christians should think about that. And we just, we lived through COVID when if we heard it once, we heard it a dozen times from evangelical leaders, you know, Romans 13, therefore put your mask on Romans 13, therefore get your jab Romans 13, therefore shut your church. I mean, it's just, it's, it's bizarre to me that that seemed to be almost the only uh, mechanism for uh, arguing the case that many of these guys were making. That's interestingly, it was the same case that government officials and leftists were making too. But tell us about your own take on the role of government and how Christians should think about that. Yeah, thanks. That's a fantastic question. I think we all need to continue to wrestle with. There's been, uh, I think there have been fewer texts in recent history that have had more violence done to them uh, than Romans 13. Uh, Poor boy needs a break. So hopefully (laughs) he can can get one here soon. But, you know, from working in government, a perspective that I had that I knew, if, if you understand how our government works in the United States of America, which sadly many don't and many pastors don't, um, the Constitution is the highest law in the land. Yeah. So as, as faithful expositors and appliers of Scripture to our lives today, we have to ask ourselves, who is the governing authority in our lives in the United States that would be equivalent to the governing authority in Paul's day in Roman? Who's the sovereign we're actually submitting to? Well, in the United States context, it's not ultimately the president. It's not the governor. It's not the mayor. It's not the dog catcher. It's the Constitution of the United States. The supremacy clause in the Constitution of the United States it makes this explicitly clear that everybody swears an oath and all elected officials who do so um, are, are to rule at us in accordance with the principles of the Constitution, including the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, freedom of assembly, freedom of worship. And so that just wasn't a part of the conversation. It seemed that so many pastors, um, Christian thinkers viewed the sovereign that we would ultimately submit to to be the mayoral or gover, you know, governing representative. And so quite frankly, one of the things going forward that I would love to encourage pastors to do is to re- recover the idea that um, if the government is coming to them and telling them to do something that's contra the Constitution, let alone contra the word of God, don't gather, that they say, thank you, uh, we'll take that under advisement. We may do that, uh, but if we don't, uh, we'll be meeting here, and you're welcome to take us to court if you'd like to, but we're going to continue to exercise our freedoms. We're not going to give up our freedoms 
and then sort of sue to get them back. Yeah. Amen. Well, I, I say <laughs> full agreement with you on that. It's the approach that we tried to take here once we got our bearings a little bit when those initial announcements were made about uh, the new uh, bubonic plague that was upon us. Everybody was afraid that it might be that. But it, it's been disheartening to see the way that so many heretofore, or theretofore, I should say, trusted evangelicals and leaders and institutions just kind of caved on it. It's like, nope, we'll, we'll stay closed till the government tells us that we can open up again. And uh, that spurred us on in what we did in 2020 in, in announcing the beginning of what is now this uh, Institute of Public Theology. It just became crystal clear that uh, much of the theology that we love and praise God for, that he's taught us from his word, that we've shared in common with so many people, seemed to be in this uh, subjective, pietistic silo. And that that's where we could be fine with it. But once you start looking outside and saying, well, what's going on in the world and how does the theology apply to these government dictates and to these mandates that are handed down to us, not even from government institutions, but from employers or others, well, then we just have to comply. And so we, we're very much committed here at Founders to taking theology public or, or to recovering the public with theology because it's not something that has been ever off limits to Jesus. So what do you see going on today in um, evangelical public theology? Yeah, well, I think you already touched on it, and that's the, uh, the need to counter what's become an individualized, pietistic conception of um, faith claims. The, the idea that Jesus is just, say, our personal Lord and Savior, mm-hmm. and that's sort of where things stop, that it's something that submission to the reign of Christ is only mm-hmm. internal in our hearts or maybe also in our churches. But, you know, as, as Kyber said, there's every square inch of creation, you know, says mine to, to the sovereign creator God. And so um, we, need to, we need to smash the myth of the neutral public square. Um, I certainly have some differences with the brother, but I appreciate how uh, Jonathan Lehman describes the public square as a battleground of gods. I think that's accurate. In fact, as I was sort of prepping for this conversation, I, this, is, this might sound like a curveball, but I think one of the best chapters out there on public theology that I've come across is chapter one in the book Church Membership by Jonathan Lehman in, um, from 2012. So this is a while back yeah. in which he just boldly exclaims, Jesus has imperium. That he, he says, every Christian needs to get this clear, that the church does not exist by the will or the permission of the state. Mm. And he underscores also very clearly that the states don't exist. State governments only exist by the authority of God. Mm. Uh, and so what do we need to do as evangelicals? We need to you know, recognize that God is on his sovereign throne over all creation, and that includes civil governments, and they're responsible to him. And two, our faith claims are not just individual and, and pietistic, but they have profound implications on the lives that we live together in civic society, and we shouldn't be afraid to press those out into the public arena. That's good. You know, maybe we ought to start talking around here, Graham, about uh, do you – trust Jesus as your public Lord and Savior. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe does our nation trust Jesus as its public well, Lord and Savior? Yeah, I just want Christians right. to do it individually. You know, I hope we can uh, begin to see that. Well, that's fascinating. That's good. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because um, I found some of Lehman's stuff helpful as well. Um, and I think one thing that we need to do is we need to start kind of getting away from from speaking of the church as kind of this consulate or this embassy that's here in this land that's kind of a neutral land, but really what it is, it's a military outpost. Mm -hmm. And I'm not speaking militaristically Mm -hmm, as in mm -hmm. violence, but it is a, it's a military outpost in which the church goes forth and it conquers and it expands the kingdom of God in this world. Mm -hmm. And so in these nations, you know, Daniel two, the the nations are toppling and the kingdom of Christ is expanding. Um, And so I think it's been unhelpful to kind of think of the church as an embassy. An embassy, yeah, that's fascinating. And it's more helpful to think of the church as a military outpost. A strike force. Yeah. yeah, Hey, that's... I'm kind of buying into that. I, I like that uh, thought. I have to think like more about that. it. Yeah. So, William, uh, what's next for you, man? What are your What are your hopes and goals over the next several years? Yeah. Well, I, I hope to to finish my MDiv. So I'm I'm trying to wrap that up um, while while juggling work and and family commitments. 
And then I do have a, a very vested interest, the desire to do further studies, um, potentially THM, PhD. Um, if the Lord would give me the grace to allow me to, you know, serve in a, in a church in some capacity as, as an elder, as a pastor, I, I would love to do that. Um, I, I love, you know, I love opening God's word. And, you know, in, in this conversation, you know, it's, it's not that God's word is not sufficient by any means and that God's word does not ultimately take priority. Um, I, I think church work is the most important work, winning, winning souls. We care about all suffering, particularly eternal suffering. The, the question we're wrestling here with is in the evangelical space, have we sort of um, let God's word be bound behind the church doors when we really should be pressing it out further into public life? And I think that's that's accurate. But I, I still just love the the basic rhythm of here's a here's a text of scripture. What does it say? How should we live? Here's the gospel. Repent and believe in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, and, but then also, I, I do hope to uh, take the experience that I've had and um, help help others like yourselves build sort of a better, braver public theology, political theology um, for the decades to come in the United States. It's something I'm very interested in helping equip pastors think better about the intersection of faith and politics um, and church and state, et cetera. Well, we need it. Yeah, desperately. William, thank you so much for your time today. Man, it's great to get to know you a little bit better. Look forward to having personal fellowship with you in the future. And if you're not following William on Twitter, you need to do that. You can see his Twitter handle that's uh, in the notes of this podcast. Thank you for listening to us today. Before we sign off, we want to make you aware that we have a new podcast stream that includes the Sermons of Founders Ministries. In fact, that's the name of it, Sermons by Founders Ministries. And you can search it on any of those platforms. We are putting in this stream now messages that go back uh, almost 40 years for from different founders conferences so that you can access them and benefit from them thanks to our founders alliance members founders alliance churches that support us we're grateful uh, for your partnership in this ministry if you have benefited from the conversation today please share the show and let other people know about it as well we look forward to joining with you again soon